Retired newspaper man and historian Willis Peck has created a printing museum on his property in Saratoga, California. Today he shows us his linotype, a model number five, made in 1947 and restored by his friend Jim Gard. This is my friend Jim Gard, whom I met uh, at the Printers Guild in San Jose, and he is the one who has made all of this possible. Well, thank you, Willis. As Willis mentioned, he met us at a Printers Guild in San Jose. I'm the chairman of that guild, and I've done quite a bit of work for the last few years on this wonderful piece of equipment here behind me. In fact, this machine was so complicated in its day Edison referred it to as to the eighth wonder of the world. Now I'm going to give you an explanation of how this whole machine works, but before I begin, I might want to tell you a little bit about the background that leads up to needing this machine in the printing industry. If you go back to the early days of typesetting, go all the way back to Gutenberg in the middle of the 1400s, they were setting type by hand, putting things together for books and eventually in magazines and newspapers right up until the 1800s. Now this machine comes along in the 1800s by Otmar Mergenthaler's handiwork in putting together a machine that would assemble little matrices by typing on a keyboard and produce slugs of type metal that could be used in printing in place of that handset type. I'm going to show you how this machine works and take you through its entire process. So let's start. At the top of the machine is a magazine full of matrices. Each little matrix carries a character And that character is assembled into this assembly area here. It's carried through the machine to where molten metal is injected from the back, and a nice shiny slug of metal comes out, piping hot, that carries the characters that will be printed on the page. Well, let's take a look at how the matrices come down from above. The magazine holds 90 channels of these little matrices. And when you press a key on the keyboard, it will release a matrix which will slide down these nice channels here and it will join the other matrices in the assembly area here. Now I can't leave the cover open while running the machine or the matrices will fall out. So I'll put the cover back down and we'll fire it up. And let's put together a line. So you can see the matrices come down right here and I'm going to put together particular line of characters. Okay. Now we have our complete line there. The operator of the machine would look in this little window area here and see the characters on the opposite side of each matrix. So each matrix carries the mold on one side and the character on the other. So you're reading it frontwards on this side. When the line is complete, it's ready to be sent in. Push the big lever down and the machine will take it across and drop it into the casting area over here. That drops in for the molten metal to be injected from the back. The machine trims off the slug that's been cast and ejects it right down here. Now it would be one thing to show this machine from this side, but it's a lot more fun to look inside and see how these slugs came to be. Now when, this, when these matrices are sent in for casting, the machine will rotate these molds on this disc into position. 
Now there are four molds here, and the one we're using today is this one over here with the 12 pica opening. Now I'm going to use the hand crank over here to turn it around, but this is its position for casting. So the machine positions it here, and the matrices that were sent in are held by a pair of jaws just in front of the mold like this. The molten metal will be injected from the back. This part, the mold, makes the body of the slug, while the matrices form the letters on the front. The metal goes in molten, but freezes when it hits the face of the room temperature matrices. After it's cast, the mold continues on its journey around to get the back of it trimmed by knives on the back, and it continues on around to its ejection position where ejector blades will push it out between a pair of blades on the opposite side, trimming off the top and bottom of the slug where we saw it appear on the other side of the machine. Another feature of this machine is something that we take for granted today. When you type on your computer and you set a line of text, you expect it to automatically justify. You can have nice clean margins left and right. This machine does it mechanically. I'm holding in my fingers here just a couple of matrices, and in between them is a special space called a space band. The space band is a pair of wedges, and right before the machine casts the line, it lifts this set of wedges up, increasing the space between each word until the line is justified. Now I'm assembling the line with space bands, so each time I hit the space key, one of these space bands drops in. These are the space bands that are going to expand when the line is cast. All right, now I'm going to send the line in to be cast. We'll stop the machine so we can get a shot of when it's going to uh, actually lift the space bands. Okay, now if you can put your shot in there. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. And here it goes. Okay, and I need to tell this. It's not actually cast or anything. Okay, that <laughs> should see the space bands climb up right before it's cast. There they are. Now the pot you're looking at is at a temperature of 535 degrees. When that plunger descends, it injects the metal into the mold and casts the slug. Now after it's cast that slug, the matrices are ready to go back to be sorted. Now in the old days when you set type by hand, somebody had to sort it all and put it back in the type cases. But this machine takes care of that by sending the matrices back up to the top of the machine where they're run along a rail. Now that rail has little teeth on it that match the teeth on the top of the matrix. Each matrix carries its own unique keying. As they slide along the rail, they fall off where they belong as the rail teeth end in the appropriate positions. Now I'm going to run this matrix through, uh, the, the line that I've got to cast through, and we're going to see the arm come down to pick them up, and it'll carry them back up to the top of the machine. Casting. Here comes the arm to pick them up, and they're on their way. They're slid on the rail, and now they're going across where they'll fall back into the magazine. Now a lot of people uh, see the big linotype machine produce these wonderful slugs of bright shiny metal with the letters on the edge and 
they don't really have the association of how does that get into the printed world. And what I'm doing right now is taking them to a very small 1800s printing press. This little tabletop press uh, would have been used to print calling cards. And I'm putting into its little chase here the slugs we just cast on the linotype machine. Now we put these in position. And we'll make sure that they're sitting flat on our little stone here. And then we're going to put them in this little press. The press will take care of inking the face of the type. And it does that automatically by rolling a little ink roller back and forth from an ink plate at the top of the machine. It has a thin coating of some very viscous ink on it. And then that ink is applied to the type, which I've now put in here. This, these are the linotype slugs we just cast. I guess I already had a card in there. And now when I push the lever the rest of the way, it prints on the card.